I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Afton Mansouri, who's an expert in humanitarian supply chain and a member of OAS. So um, Ashley is going to talk to us on humanitarian supply chain management towards the framework for disaster relief in Iran. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Ruth, for the introduction. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming to this presentation. It was supposed to be a rather informal <laughs> discussion, but last night, Ruth informed me that it's going to be filmed, so <laughs> it made me a little bit uh, nervous. I haven't performed that much in front of camera, but I'll try my best to uh, communicate what I wanted to talk about. Uh, what I'm going to talk uh, about today is a short story about a fairly long-term uh, uh, long activity, long-term collaboration we've started in 2010 with the University of Tehran for disaster relief in Iran from a supply chain management perspective. And I, uh, I'm not going to cover everything in this uh, period because it's too much for a short presentation, but I'm just going to highlight some of the key points and areas that we uh, have explored, what we did and uh, what is the plan for future and highlight some areas for future research and collaboration. I'm going to uh, put my presentation into the framework of a short story about a small plant, an apple tree, that we've planted a few years ago and it has brought some fruits uh, so far. So I'm going to use this analogy throughout my presentation. I start by providing a short overview of the humanitarian supply chain management. What is it about and uh, how is it different from general supply chain management that everybody knows. And I will proceed with the project we started with a funding by ESRC for disaster relief in Iran. And I focus on two of the projects that I was involved in this collaboration uh, for relief network design in Tehran, which is prone to earthquake and preparation for earthquake is a major priority for the city. And I will provide a quick overview of the results, the academic results and non-academic results in terms of the impact that we've achieved so far and conclude with future research directions. As you all know, natural disasters is a global issue uh, because of so many factors, population growth, uh, global trend, in urbanism, 100 years ago, London was the most populous city in the world with 4 million uh, uh, people. And I think it was one of the uh, very few cities above the million. But nowadays, we have many, many uh, more than million, multi-million uh, cities. And in case of a disaster in any of these areas, the scale and uh, volume of disaster and fatality is huge. That's it. That's one of the reasons for the growing trend in the uh, damage and uh, the, effect, uh, the effect of natural disasters. The way land is being used, cities are now being built in areas which are not suitable for uh, large populations in Tehran. 200 years ago, it was just a small village. It's an area which has three faults running through it. It is now home to 10 million people. So the way land is used has introduced some new uh, threats and risks. Only in the past two decades, earthquake as one of the uh, natural disasters was responsible for the death of 800,000 people and the number of people who uh, have lost their homes and been affected is multifold by storm, by drought, by flood, different types of disasters has massively influenced everyone's life. So it's a major problem for everybody. And it's not a problem just for the developing world. We see natural disasters happening around the world. In 2001, 
uh, tsunami hit Japan and massively impacted this country and many other countries which were connected to Japan and we relied on the uh, products being made in Japan. Earthquake in New Zealand, hurricane in uh, the United States, and in UK, flood is the major natural uh, disaster. So everyone has something at stake in regards to uh, natural disasters. As you can see in this diagram, which is adapted from the uh, international database for disasters called MDAT. Uh, this is the damage caused by disasters from 1900 until 2012. As you can see from 1900 till about 1960, we don't see that much uh, damage as a result of natural disasters. But the trend has uh, been increasing and in recent years every year we have something around three, four hundred billion dollar damage just as a result of natural disasters. And these pics are for instance this uh, in 2011 as a result of tsunami in Japan. Hurricane Katrina in 2005 was the main cause of this growth uh, in the United States and other uh, disasters. And in terms of the spread of different types of disasters in different areas, in different regions, in Asia the main uh, cause of natural disaster and the main cause of those losses is earthquake, as you can see in this uh, green area. Whereas in, for instance, Europe, uh, flood is the main cause of uh, losses. In America, storm, tornadoes, cyclones, and uh, things like this. So we have a different portfolio of disasters in different areas and different regions which require different types of preparation. Not all disasters are the same. In, se in some disasters we have some time for preparation. Uh, for instance, for flood, we can have uh, some time for preparation, whereas in uh, earthquake it's happening all of a sudden, so there is no time for preparation. In terms of logistics and supply chain management, they uh, will imply different logistical challenges. For responding to earthquake, we need to have a very well developed preparation plan, whereas for responding to flood, an early warning system and a very efficient logistics system for evacuation and relocation is very important. So it, they have different implications from logistics and supply chain management side. The interest and attention of the research community to humanitarian supply chain management uh, was uh, attracted as a result of the chaos in uh, Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004, which hit 14 countries and killed 230,000 people and created a chaos in uh, this region. This is a quote uh, from the Fit, uh, Fritz Institute. As humanitarian organizations mobilized to provide relief in this devastating and chaotic environment, it became apparent that complex supply chains would be crucial for effective relief, delivering food, shelter, and medical supplies from around the world. And that was one of the uh, milestones in attracting attention of the research community to the importance of implementing some of the practices from commercial domain uh, to improving efficiency and effectiveness of uh, relief operation. A year after that, uh, we had another story in the United States in uh, Orleans areas. area. We uh, had uh, the Hurricane Katrina, which was one of the uh, 
strongest hurricanes in the UK, one of the five deadliest hurricanes in the UK that killed 1,800 people, and uh, costliest natural disaster in the, uh, in the US. But the response to this disaster was different compared to Indian Ocean tsunami. In this uh, incident, uh, we saw a very positive and effective response from a commercial uh, company, Walmart, uh, which had a wide presence in the area. In order to keep their operation up and running, they had a very well rehearsed business continuity plan in place because uh, hurricanes are common there and uh, they were prepared to respond to it. Soon after the hurricane uh, hit the area, uh, they started doing their own business by providing food and whatever they had to the affected, affected areas. And it proved to be much more effective than the relief so, uh, provided by the US Army. And armies are usually uh, the strongest players in relief operation. But in that uh, event, the relief operation, the support provided by Walmart, was much more effective than the US Army, what the US Army did. And uh, that was another evidence that good practices from the commercial sector has the potential to improve the relief operation. And from that point on, uh, this uh, trend was uh, increasing and many branches and organizations set up around the world to deal with specifically humanitarian logistics and supply chain. And in the commercial uh, domain, disasters have a commercial impact as well, in addition to the social and societal impact to cities and urban areas. Businesses are also influenced and affected by uh, disasters. After, for instance, a uh, flood in Thailand in 2011, many companies uh, ran uh, short of spare parts and components which were made in Thailand. And that uh, increased the importance of uh, dealing with disasters even in the commercial sector, not only as a humanitarian activity, but from a commercial perspective. To classify the activities which need to be implemented during a disaster, uh, it's better to classify different phases along the disaster cycle. When a disaster happens at any uh, point of time, right before disaster we have a stage or a phase which is called preparation. Preparation to respond to disaster. And soon after the event we have response phase. All activities, the majority of the activities in the humanitarian logistic domain is centered around this event, shortly before event and shortly after it. But there are two other more important phases. After response, the societies, the uh, areas which are affected need to recover, <coughs> which is usually a very uh, long uh, lasting activity, it takes months to years in some Areas may be generations, in case of, for instance, social conflicts and mass migrations. People who are mi uh, forced to migrate from their areas need, may need to live in refugee camps for decades, which is actually uh, during the course of recovery. And after recovery, uh, measures need to be put in place in order to mitigate the negative impacts of disaster and to help uh, build resilience for in, the, uh, in the affected areas. And this cycle goes on and on and through uh, good implementation of this disaster, disaster cycle, uh, disaster management cycle, it is hoped that the next disaster will be less uh, problematic and less uh, damaging. From a supply chain management perspective, if you want to look at this scenario, we have four different phases and there are a number of uh, activities. Uh, let's what supply chain management can offer to help uh, improving this situation. Supply chain management is basically 
is about getting the right products to the right people at the right place at the right time uh, at the aggregate uh, times. Okay, so it's about uh, commercial domain. Majority of these activities make still sense in the humanitarian domain. We uh, have an affected area, they have a need, they have some needs, their need need to be uh, fulfilled in time properly. Right items need to be sent to right places to the right people at the right time. So it seems that there is a potential in commercial domain to transfer some of this knowledge to the commercial, uh, to humanitarian domain. If you want to compare quickly these two areas, commercial and humanitarian domain, in commercial domain, we are talking about profit and loss. In humanitarian domain, we talk about life and death. You're talking about saving money in commercial domain, and in humanitarian domain, you're talking about saving lives. We want to minimize cost in commercial sector, whereas in humanitarian domain, we want to minimize suffering of the affected people. And at the same time, cost is also important. It doesn't imply that cost optimization, cost minimization is not an important issue. Relief agencies are running at a limited budget, which is highly unpredictable. <coughs> uh, a large proportion of donations come after disasters. So they cannot count on the resources they have. So they need to be very efficient in utilizing and using the resources, the limited resources they have. Especially in long-lasting relief operations. For instance, in uh, the refugee camps in Dadaab, in uh, the border between Kenya and Somalia, uh, 500,000 people live as a result of social conflict in their home countries for more than 10 years. So it's a city with 500,000 people living in there as a refugee camp. They need food, water, sanitation, everything on a day-to-day -day basis. School, uh, everything. So cost efficiency is, is important for uh, the agencies dealing with uh, a camp like this. There are specific challenges uh, in managing humanitarian supply chains. First and foremost, we are dealing with unpredictable demand. In commercial domain, we can predict and we can forecast what's going to be needed at what time, at what quantity. There are tools and techniques analyzing historic data. But in humanitarian domain, we don't have that much information. We don't know when and where a disaster might happen, at what magnitude and how many people will be affected, and what would be their basic needs in 24 hours after the disaster. So that's the main challenge, one of the main challenges. And secondly, we have very limited control over supply. In commercial domain, we can establish partnership with suppliers, we can negotiate our uh, uh, needs and manage uh, delivery of items, plan it, and we can do loads of preparation. But after disasters, there will be loads of items being sent from around the world uh, some of them might not be needed at all. Wrong items to wrong place, uh, to wrong people, which makes the management of supply and demand very, very complex. In addition to that, we have a huge level of uncertainties in capacities. In a commercial supply chain, we are kind of certain about, for instance, the capacity of our fleet, the roads, ports, everything. We are kind of uh, confident about the capacities we have at hand. But in disasters, some of these capacities will be lost. Bridges collapse, roads will be closed, so we don't know what capacities are available. And coordination and communication between the different parties, local governments, armies, international organizations, the affected people, local community, a very, very complex network of entities that need to collaborate and coordinate their activities among themselves. So these are uh, the factors that 
uh, make managing humanitarian supply chain uh, supply chain is very complex. Okay, let's start our uh, story about the specific project we started. Uh, in 2010, uh, we started a project using a small funding. It was actually a travel grant uh, I got from ESRC to host a colleague with whom we've been working on different uh, subjects on logistics and supply chain management uh, before. Using this funding, I invited him and he came over to him. You uh, may remember him, Dr. Ali Tarabi. Uh, he came over to Brunel and stayed here for two months. And during that project, we started reviewing the literature and analyzing the gaps in, the dif in different phases of disaster cycle uh, in uh, Iran specifically and to identify some areas for future collaboration. So that was the very start of our journey. And this uh, funding from ESRC actually established a line of collaboration between the two universities, Brunel University and the University of Tehran, which is the oldest university in Iran with a very widespread network of connection with different uh, local uh, authorities and relief agencies. Uh, so it is hoped that through this line of collaboration, we can make some impact, which I'm going to talk about briefly. In Iran, uh, we have a range of different disasters. Earthquake is the main uh, natural disaster. As you can see here, we have two main uh, chain of uh, mountains and uh, in the areas that are uh, mountainous, as you know, uh, mountains are the result of uh, activities of faults. So these areas are usually prone to earthquake. Earthqu earthquake is very common. In the recent history, we had two very deadly uh, earthquakes. In 1990, an earthquake in north of the country in this area, about 100 kilometers from Tehran, killed 40,000 people. And in 2003, an earthquake in southwest of the country in a city uh, which had no history of any seismic activity. There was a, a castle in this city. I'd visited this city before. There was a castle in there uh, that was there for 2,000 years. It was made of uh, mud, no uh, stones, nothing. With the slightest movement, it would have been collapsed, and it was there for 2,000 years, which is an evidence that there was no activity, no seismic activity for 2,000, at least for 2,000 years. But all of a sudden, an earthquake happened in the city, and it killed uh, nearly half the population of the city. And at the same time, we have uh, flood mainly in the areas which we have some main uh, rivers in here and in the north. And also drought. Iran is located in a dry area and drought is a major problem. Since 1900, in the past 110 <coughs> years, more than 130,000 people were killed only in earthquakes. And over 40 million people were affected by different types of disasters. So nearly half the population, half the current population, 60% of the current population been affected one way or another by these disasters. These are natural disasters. In terms of man-made disasters, social conflicts, uh, Iran hosts uh, one of the largest population of refugees in the world. At the moment, it hosts 850,000. A few years ago, uh, because of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, Iran hosted nearly 3 million people for many years. So dealing with refugees is another challenge as a result of man-made man disasters and social conflicts. In this project, we focused, we started uh, from the main issue in Tehran, which is earthquake. Tehran is a city located close to very high mountains, and it has three faults uh, running through its areas, and it was destroyed four times, at least four times in the past. Uh, and the last one, the latest one, 
was about 200 years ago. At that time, Tehran was not the capital city. It was just a small village with a few thousand population. So the damage and the fatality was not that uh, significant, was not recorded. But now it's, not, uh, it's home to over 10 million people. So it's a major problem. If an earthquake happens, it will affect at least this many people. So everybody has uh, something at stake. Uh, Iran Red Crescent Society, as the uh, main uh, node of connection with International Federation of Red Cross, uh, has a relief network in the city. They have established some warehouses and uh, planned for uh, prepositioning of some items in those areas in case a disaster happens to distribute and to respond to the needs. One of the projects that we uh, did, uh, actually we defined for a master's student, an MSc student, and I was uh, co-supervisor of that project, was about, uh, investigation, about uh, investigation into the effective effectiveness of this existing relief network and to design a uh, new methodology for the design of an improved network. The problem uh, decision, the decisions we needed to make, we need to make in this problem, are basically the location of facilities, central warehouses and local distribution centers, where to locate them and uh, how many, and what items to keep them as inventory prepositioning. And the objectives are minimizing response time, which is the uh, most important factor. We need to get the right item to the right people as fast as possible. So minimizing response time is very important and cost uh, because you are dealing with limited budget. For this we designed, uh, we developed a mathematical modeling uh, approach. I'm not going to bore you with details of uh, the model. The source of information that we used, we used basically three sources for uh, our modeling and development of uh, the solution technique. We used information from the municipality of Tehran in terms of traffic information, existing facilities, and inventory holding cost, uh, which need to be spent for the prepositioned items. We made use of a report uh, which was done by Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, in 2000, specifically about the risks of earthquake in Tehran. They analyzed the earthquake scenarios and analyzed the possibility of uh, damages and death rates in different areas. Uh, one of the problems we have, uh, we had in this, uh, uh, in this project was uncertainty of demand. As I mentioned earlier, uncertainty of demand is one of the main challenges of uh, humanitarian logistics and for deciding on where to locate warehouses and what to uh, keep in them, we needed some idea about the demand. So we used that data in terms of different scenarios uh, that are likely to happen as a result of different uh, uh, activation of different faults, and we used that as the main source for estimation of the data. And we used the list of uh, Iran Red Crescent Society uh, for the 55 relief items needed by each family. They have a list of 55 basic needs of any family after the earthquake, after any incident. And we used that as the main and the basic needs of families. So we designed a model and uh, solved it. We developed a new solution technique. And then we compared it with the existing network. And we found out uh, interesting results. First of all, we realized that the current network, which is in place, designed by uh, Red Crescent Society, is capable of responding to only 20% of the demand, which means 2 million people. So massive improvement is needed in terms of capacities. And by playing with configurations of the existing network without need for, future, uh, for further investment, by playing with the existing configuration and better prepositioning of the items, we came up with a solution which was 
uh, better compared to the existing network in terms of the, its ability to respond to demand. 24% of this 2 million means 500,000 people. You can see even minor improvement translates into massive numbers and massive impact, uh, which was very uh, interesting uh, observation. And we, uh, we submitted the result of this uh, paper to uh, European Journal of Operation Research, which is now under second revision. The second project which was related to the same story, designing the relief network, but this time from the municipality of Tehran's perspective, because municipality of Tehran has a responsibility to provide basic needs right after the, uh, a disaster. Provision of shelter, provision of food, provision of medical items, in parallel with Red Crescent, which is mainly responsible for uh, medical items right after the disaster. We uh, developed this project was part of a dissertation of a PhD student. It was part of a PhD uh, project for which I was co-supervisor and the student is about to finish. Uh, we designed, the project actually was about designing a decision support for the design of a uh, relief network and deciding about the routing, how to send items from different distribution centers from local uh, uh, distribution centers to the affected areas. So it was about location planning and distribution after the disaster. And we uh, designed, uh, we considered a three-layer relief network, including uh, humanitarian organizations who are sending relief items like United Nations, uh, International Federation of Red Cross, or other organizations from around the country. So we have a number of humanitarian organizations and a number of central terminals which receive these items and then distribute it to local terminals. We have a three-layer network like this. We have humanitarian organizations who send their items to a central terminals and from central terminals they will be distributed to local terminals and from local terminals to the affected people. And deciding about the number and distribution of these local terminals is very very important and sensitive. This picture is uh, from the relief operation in Haiti uh, in 2010. Uh, because of the limited number of points of distribution. Even the limited resources were not uh, distributed properly and effectively. And there was a chaos among the people, as you can see. Part of the uh, force and time of the military forces was uh, uh, put into coordination of provision of uh, food and uh, basic needs because of the limited number and improper distribution of distribution centers. Uh, again, we used some data from the municipality of Tehran in terms of existing network, local terminals, central terminals, central warehouses, and information from Iran Statistics Information Center about travel times and traffic information, things like this. And we used a uh, rule-based simulation methodology in order to analyze the situation after earthquake. We generated a number of scenarios and under each scenario we used simulation to see what's happening, what's going to happen if we have this configuration, what's going to happen after disaster, 24 hours after earthquake, what will be the average response time, what will be the average rate of uh, demand fulfilled and uh, how much cost has to be uh, spent. Uh, and the result of this uh, paper is now under second revision at International Journal of Production Economics, uh, IJPE. And we uh, came up with interesting results, again, uh, uh, similar to previous study. We uh, produced and we generated some interesting managerial insights, which we are going to discuss with uh, local authorities 
uh, to show the shortcoming of the existing network using a proper analysis of the situation after disaster, after disaster in terms of the important criteria, time to respond, fulfillment of demand, and cost. If there is any question, please feel free to ask. You don't have to wait until the end. <laughs> yes, Yulia. Rule based simulation, okay. Uh, for this project, we used MATLAB. Yes, Eva. From going back to the commercial side, you discussed the comparison between commercial and uh, humanitarian uh, level. Uh, uh, I can see it clearly that. Uh, commercial, they they have um, a good uh, plan, uh, uh, which is the, the the risk management compared compared to to okay. the national level. This is this is uh, at the uh, I may call it at the micro level. Okay. Yes. Um, give you example at the airport. We we have a very clear detailed uh, uh, disaster management plan. And at all levels, it's well defined. However, um, if there is any in the national level, I'll give you an example. You mentioned in Tehran being hit four times uh, by uh, earthquake. earthquake. If there is a clear, uh, um, a good plan and, and uh, clearly developed for disaster management? The simple answer is no. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I know the answer, by the way. That's, that's what created the chaos of the tsunami. The last one you've seen it in, in, uh, in Philippines. Because, because many cities, as you mentioned, they used to be 200,000, 100,000 uh, in a small houses, even long time ago, some of, the, some of them even tents. And suddenly, all these high-rise buildings, however, there is no clear uh, uh, disaster plan in place. Yes, that's true, but that's true. In the commercial side, in the commercial side, there is a regulation, by the way. The, the regulation, uh, 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 they must comply with the regulation. Uh, I give you example, airlines, airports, but the regulation is the government, and the government themselves, they they don't, they don't, uh, they have a well plan in case in case of a war, yes, but not as a disaster. Yes, as a natural disaster. That's that's uh, very much the case. But just a quick comment. Uh, this is one of the main uh, differences between commercial and humanitarian domain. In commercial domain, in supply to commercial supply chains, we usually have a, a supply chain leader or somebody who has the final word and they can implement or rule uh, whatever they want and force everybody else to uh, abide with those rules. For instance, Walmart can set a number of guidelines for its suppliers and inquire them to implement it. Or local governments can do the same. But in case of disaster, even local government doesn't exist. In Haiti, local government vanished. Nobody is in place to coordinate these things. That's one of the differences. So can I come in terms of your example of an airport? Because the system is done by people or humans. So there is, of course, risk management. There is tolerance risk. Yeah, but, but my no, there is a process. So the natural disaster is being kept and controlled. I understand. No, 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 no. I'm getting, I'm getting to this point, if you, if you let, if you let me, I'll, I'll get to that point. We have, uh, we have some, some interesting observations. I'm going to talk at the end of my uh, presentation, so bear with me. Uh, so these are two uh, sample projects we did in this uh, collaboration and a number of other uh, projects in uh, the business side about business continuity planning and business continuity management because businesses are also affected by disasters. It's not just uh, cities and uh, urban areas. 
In short, uh, in terms of results, what we achieved so far in terms of academic output, that small plant produced some uh, results. Although small, but something. Uh, we made some presentations in relevant conferences to relevant bodies. We established good connection with the College of Humanitarian Operation and Disaster Management as part of Production and Operations Management Society. And we made presentations at uh, UCL Institute for Disaster and Risk Reduction and in the OR Society Annual Conference. And in terms of academic journals, so far we have submitted four papers and about to submit the fifth one. The first two one I mentioned, one uh, under second revision at EJUR about the network uh, relief design in uh, Tehran. The decision support system for managing humanitarian relief is under second revision at IJPE. In the commercial side, uh, we submitted this paper to EJUR and we received very interesting results. I never had this response from EJUR before. It's a very tough journal. And in the first submission, they just wanted minor revision, which is very odd for this journal. And we are now working on the minor revision. And another fourth paper to IJRPR, International Journal of Production Research. And we are about to submit this fifth paper to uh, Transportation Research Part E uh, about resilient supplier selection and order lot sizing problem under uncertainty and disruption risks. Uh, I made a presentation out of this work in the recent annual conference of the OR Society in Exeter. And in my presentation, there were people from Marks and Spencer. Mark and Spencer had a presentation right after me in the same session. And the head of uh, logistics strategy at Mark and Spencer commended this work, not my work, this work three times as very, very interesting in three occasions. They liked the idea and we may go for some collaboration with them in uh, introducing some measures for managing risk along their supply chains. And in terms of articles in practitioners' journals, uh, which is more, which is closer to uh, application, we, uh, sub we published two papers, one in crisis response journal, which is a journal uh, which uh, read by uh, crisis management practitioners, heads of uh, 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 emergency planning uh, departments, Red Crescent. One of the editorial members of this journal is vice president of Iran Red Crescent Society. I didn't know that. When I looked at the list of editorial board, I realized all practitioners are in this journal. And it is read by practitioners. When we submitted this paper, I was waiting for its publication and I didn't know when it uh, will be published. Uh, I received a con connect request on LinkedIn from one of the uh, emergency planning managers from the uh, uh, Council of Auckland in New Zealand, talking about my article that she found interesting and wanted to connect. From that side, I noticed that the paper is published. So it is. Uh, widely read by practitioners. And in Iran, we uh, wrote and published an article in uh, prevention, Disaster Prevention and Management Knowledge Quarterly. This journal is published by uh, Tehran Disaster Mitigation and Management Organization, who is the main organization responsible for managing crisis and events after disasters in the city. And they, uh, we had a meeting with them, and publication of this article helped us to reach out our message to the readers of this magazine, policymakers and local authorities uh, about the importance of taking a scientific approach in uh, managing continuity of operations. But those fruits are not good enough unless somebody pick them and eat them. So in terms of the impact, what can I, uh, what I uh, can summarize as the realized impact so far? First of all is capacity building 
at the University of Tehran. This is, I think, a very important impact. Uh, there is now a group of people working there, and they have started establishing a research center uh, run by the University of Tehran. And students, postgrad students, PhD students are working around this topic, and they have good connection with local authorities, emerge, uh, uh, relief organizations, and it is very likely that through them, something can be done in the field. And as a first activity, through the engagement with Tehran Disaster Mitigation Management and Mitigation Organization, we recommended a number of areas for collaboration with them. Going back to your point, Abraham, about continuity management. They are the organization in charge of continuity of the city, but they didn't have a business continuity plan for themselves. So one of the recommendations we made, and they uh, agreed, was a business continuity planning project for them, in order for them to be able to run their operation after a disaster. And this project is in the final stages of uh, signing, which I think will facilitate further collaboration with them in other areas, in terms of coordination, collaboration. Uh, they have uh, uh, ruling power in case of a disaster to uh, govern everything, hospitals, police forces, uh, I don't know, ambulances, fire services, everything. They have the ruling power in case a disaster happens. And we are hoping through them to be able to make some uh, change in the current practice uh, they do in their operation. And for future, what we hope to do is, first of all, more engagement with local beneficiaries to reach out our message to them about, for instance, the shortage of capacity uh, in the relief network in Tehran and things that can be done in order to improve the situation and to engage with them. That's uh, one of our main priorities. Raising awareness of relief organizations of the lessons that can be learned from commercial supply chain is another priority. And uh, working on recovery and mitigation phases, which are the most neglected phases of the disaster cycle. With my PhD student, Jennifer, uh, we started looking into uh, the activities that can be managed by the so-called uh, collaborative aid networks uh, during the recovery, immediate recovery stage. And the notion of collaborative aid networks uh, was coined by a professor from the United States, Professor Holguin Veras, after the Haiti earthquake. After, in the uh, Haiti earthquake, one of the most effective relief networks was the network of churches. They have 11,000 churches in there, and through their collaboration and connection with other churches around the world, with Spain, with Portugal, with around the world, they managed to provide a very efficient response because they knew what exactly is needed in the field and who is the best person to contact and how to source the items from uh, their uh, network in other countries. So they were proved very effective in the response uh, stage. Jennifer is now looking into uh, possibility of extending this engagement to immediate recovery. And we have a good example of this type of networks in Iran, the network of mosques. And uh, it is possible to transfer some of that knowledge to improving response and immediate recovery uh, through the use of community network. And uh, there are areas for interdisciplinary research that uh, we want to uh, explore further. From the social science perspective, disasters and responding to disaster is, uh, poses major social uh, challenges. And we want to explore, and I think it is very important to explore, the social aspects of relief operation. When we are talking about disaster, we are talking about huge number of people being affected. After the typhoon Haiyan in Philippines, the number of people who were displaced had to move from their home to other areas was equivalent to the population of Warsaw, 
Rome, Paris, and London combined. So we are talking about huge migration of people from their uh, homes. What will happen to them? What are the social implications of this migration, uh, losing their homes? And uh, in the other side, in the relief operation uh, for those who are responsible to provide aid and support to the affected people. Their job is very complex and difficult. Uh, let's compare the operation of humanitarian logistician with a courier delivery like DHL. DHL uh, delivers a parcel to home, gets a sign, end of story, goodbye. Okay? But a humanitarian logistician who delivers an item is probably the only person in contact with the affected people, the only point of contact with the outside world. So they don't expect just, okay, here's the water, I'm off. No, 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 he or she needs to be there to listen to them and to deal with their needs and uh, demands and to be able to communicate with them. So communication, some sites, some aspects of uh, psychology, all of these things are important for educating and for training humanitarian logisticians who are able to uh, act more effectively uh, in disaster response. So these are the aspects of social uh, side of relief operation that we would like to explore further. And from the environmental aspect, uh, there are uh, things that can be learned from the environmental science side in order to be better prepared. Uh, in the recent uh, tornado in Oklahoma, uh, the speed of tornado and the affected area was so quick and regardless of the very well uh, planned early warning system, because of minutes of delay in communica communicating right message to the people, a uh, matter of minutes, uh, so many people uh, were suffered. So a more effective warning system connected with uh, practice and experience of environmentalists, environmental scientists, is hope to improve effectiveness of relief operation uh, and uh, for better preparation. The final word, as the World Food Program says, we cannot prevent disasters, but we can ensure that communities are better prepared to face them. And I hope uh, we can do something about it. Thank you very much. I'm prepared to take questions. Well, coordination and collaboration is one of the biggest challenges of relief operation. That's true. Uh, we think that there are some lessons that can be learned from commercial domain, but they might not be efficient enough to address the whole situation. It might improve it to some extent. In the commercial domain, we have a good practice of collaboration and coordination between different members of a supply chain, usually managed by the supply chain leader. So communication and uh, collaboration starts uh, from the preparation stage. So the more we know about who is likely to get involved in relief operation and to start establishing some line of connections with them, uh, the better prepared we uh, can be for responding to disasters. But it is a very big challenge. We don't know exactly who is going to get involved. 
and what would be the situation at that time, the political situation between the organizations, between the different countries, they all uh, add further complexity to the situation. Infrastructure, one point, but disaster or natural disaster caused. But are you looking at the, you said about communication and whatever. Are you looking at the infrastructure of the communication system, not just about bridges? You know what happened? Yes, yes. Telephone doesn't work, mobile. Absolutely. Uh, and there's a part of your research looking on that. That's a very interesting uh, point. We haven't explored that aspect, but it's a very interesting point. It's a very interesting topic. Uh, communication for communication, you need some infrastructure, and uh, uh, these infrastructures are subject to damage themselves. So we lose lines and phones and any, everything. Uh, we haven't explored it, but I think there was a PhD research a few years ago, if I remember rightly, uh, at Brunel. They were looking, the student was looking at this specific issue, if I remember rightly. Let me check it with you. But this is one of the areas that we need to yet to explore. There is a huge gap. We've just started this journey. This apple tree is lost, just lost. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's. Okay, um, I think we, oh, did you say something? Quick comment. Uh, yes. You said that we learn from the uh, commercial side. Uh, I, I came from the airlines, and the airlines uh, will establish in disaster management. And you discussed uh, the social aspects. Uh, after the disasters in America, the uh, 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 TWA and uh, Pan Am, America now, any airlines fly to the US, they must have in place uh, uh, a well-structured system dealing with, with the social uh, aspects. And um, I attended uh, one week training in, in this aspect. Uh, for dealing with uh, uh, dealing with families, dealing with the social aspects, and and many airlines they have a contract. There is a, a big organization, and this organization deal with the, in case of any disaster. But as you said, it's a massive scale, and they will have several organizations. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll take further details of these documents yes. from you. It's okay. very interesting. Although the scale might be small, but. Yes, yes. There might be, there should be something that can be uh, scaled. It's a will structure. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ashish. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.